Hello and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we read a story about Blackbeard the Pirate, as we read a chapter from the book Blackbeard Buccaneer, written by Ralph D. Payne. My son and I were driving around town the other day when he asked about the next story in the podcast. I told him that I was going to do one about the Three Musketeers. He didn't know what that was, so I explained it to him. He said that it sounded okay, but an episode about Blackbeard would be great. So, I went from almost doing an episode about the Three Musketeers to an episode about pirates. But who doesn't like pirates? Anyway, I will put a disclaimer about this episode that there is a little bit of violence in this episode as it talks about the last fight that Blackbeard had before he died. I don't think it's anything that is too bad, but if I had to give it a rating, I would definitely say it's PG. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. And teach. Yes, there was Blackbeard's ship hard in the sand, which had gripped her keel while she was steering to enter the Cherokee Inlet. There was no pearly vapor of swamp mist out here to shroud her from attack. The air was clear and bright, with a robust breeze which stirred a flashing surf on the shoals. Under lower sails, the two sloops watchfully crept nearer until their crews could examine the stranded brig and read the story of her plight. She stood on a slant with the decks sloped toward the enemy. This made it impossible to use her guns with any great effect. Captain Wellsby tacked ship and kept the King George well away from the quay, as Joe Hawkridge advised. With an ebbing tide, it was unsafe to venture into shallower water in order to pound Blackbeard's vessel with broadsides. Lieutenant Maynard came aboard in a small boat and was quite the dandy with his brocaded coat and ruffles and velvet small clothes. One might have thought he had engaged to dance the minuet. Colonel Stewart met him in a spick and span uniform of his majesty's foot, cross belts piped clayed white as snow, boots polished until they shone. Such gentlemen were punctilious in war 200 years ago. Your solid shot will not pound him much at this range, my good sir, said the lieutenant. With his hull so badly listed toward us, you can no more than splinter the decks while his men take shelter below. I grant you that, regretfully replied the soldier, and case shot will not scatter to do him much harm. Shall I blaze away and demoralize the rascals whilst you make ready your boats? Toss a few rounds into the varlets, Colonel Stewart. It may keep them from massing on deck. One boat from your ship, if it please you, with twenty picked men. I shall take twenty men from each sloop as boarders. Sixty in all? queried the colonel. Why not take a hundred? They would be tumbling over one another. Too much confusion. This is not a large vessel yonder. We must have room on deck to swing and cut. I will have my men away in ten minutes, Lieutenant Maynard. Crisply replied the blonde, raw-boned Scotsman with a finger at his hat brim in courteous salute. He proceeded to call the men by name, strapping sober fellows who had followed the sea amid the frequent perils of the merchant service. Jack Cockerell was the only landsman, and he felt greatly honored that he should be included. Gone was his unmanly trepidation. Was he more worthy to live than these humble seamen who fought to make the ocean safer for other voyagers, who were true kinsmen of the Elizabethan heroes of Blue Water. He tarried a moment to wring Joe Hawkridge's hand in farewell and to tell him, If I have ill luck in this adventure, old comrade, do you mind presenting my best compliments and, and a fond farewell to Mistress Dorothy Stewart? Strike me, Jack. Stow that or you'll have me blubberin', said Joe. Bring me a lock of Captain Teach's whiskers as a token for my last and fail, if ever I clap eyes on her again. And you'd best take this heavy cutlass, which I wedded a purpose for ye. Twill split a pirate like slicing an apple. 
With this useful gift in his hand, Master Cockerel swung himself into the boat where Colonel Stewart stood in the stern sheets. Perhaps he, too, was dwelling on a fair maid named Dorothy who might be left fatherless before the sun climbed an hour higher. The sloops were moving nearer the quay under sail and oar, trailing their crowded boats behind them. Blackbeard had hauled two or three of his guns into such positions that he could open fire, but the sloops crawled doggedly into the shoal water and so screened their boats until those were ready to cast off for the final dash. It was a rare sea picture, the stranded brig with canvas loose on the yards and ropes streaming, her listed decks a swarm with pirates in outlandish, very colored garb, the surf playing about her in a bright dazzle and the gulls screaming overhead. The broad, squat figure of Blackbeard himself was never more conspicuous. He no longer strutted the quarterdeck but was all over the ship, menacing his men with his pistols, shifting them in groups for defense, shouldering bags of munitions, or heaping up the grenades and stink pots to be lighted and thrown into the attacking boats. It was his humor to adorn himself more elaborately than usual. Under his broad hat with the great feather in it, he had stuck lengths of toe matches which were all sputtering and burning so that he could run to and fro in a cloud of sparks and smoke like that evil one whom he professed to admire. He realized, no doubt, that this was likely to be his last stand. The inferno, which he was so fond of counterfeiting, fairly yawned at his feet. And now the sloops let go of their anchors, while from astern of them appeared the three boats of the assailants. They steered wide of each other to seek different parts of the pirate brig, and so divide Blackbeard's force. The boats of Colonel Stewart and Lieutenant Maynard were racing for the honor of first place alongside. Blackbeard trained two guns on them, filled with grape and chain shot, and one boat was shattered but a swam long enough for the cheering men to pull it to the brig and toss their grapples to the rail which was inclined quite close to the water. They were in the surf which broke against the ship, but this was a mere trifle. Most of them went up the side like cats, leaping for the chains and dead eyes, slashing at the nettings, swinging by a rope's end, or digging their toes in a crack of a gun port. Forward they were pouring over the bowsprit, vaulting like acrobats from the anchor stocks or swarming up the stays. It seemed beyond belief that they could gain footing on the decks with Blackbeard's demons stabbing and hacking and shooting at them, but in such manner as this was many a great sea fight won in the brave days of old. Lieutenant Maynard gained his lodgment in the bows amid a swirl of pirates who tried to pen him in front of the forecastle house. But as tars of the Royal Navy were accustomed to close quarters and they straightway made room for themselves. Chest to chest and hand to hand, they hewed their way toward the waist of the ship where Colonel Stewart raged like the bra, bonny Highlander that he was. Almost at the same time, the third boat had made fast under the jutting stern gallery and its twenty men were piling in through the cabin windows like so many human projectiles. In the King George Brigantine, Captain Jonathan Wellesby fidgeted and gnawed his lip with a telescope at his eye while he watched the conflict in which he could scarce distinguish friend from foe. He could see Blackbeard charge aft to rally his men and then whirl back to lunge into the melee where towered Colonel Stewart's tall figure. The powder smoke from pistols and muskets drifted in a thin blue haze. Joe Hawkridge was fairly shaking with nervousness as he said to the skipper, There'll be no clearing the decks lest they down that monster of a Captain Teach. And he has more lives than a cat. See you, my dear crony, Master Jack. No, I cannot make him out in that mad turmoil, replied Captain Wellsby. Nip and tuck, I call it, Joe. This was the opinion forced upon Lieutenant Maynard as he saw the engagement resolve itself into a series of bloody whirlpools, his seamen and the pirates intermingled. He won his way past the forecastle into the wider spaces of the deck, with only a few of his twenty tars on their feet. Colonel Stewart was hard-pressed, and the boarders who had come over the stern had as much as they could do to hold their own. Thus far, the issue was indecisive. Jack Cockrell had kept close to the colonel and felt amazement that he was still alive. 
His cheek was laid open, a bullet had torn his thigh, and a powder burn streaked his neck. But he felt those hurts not at all. It was a nightmare from which there seemed no escape. He saw Blackbeard rush at him with a raucous shout of, The scurvy young cockerel! He will ne'er crow again! Colonel Stewart sprang between them, blades clashed, and they were swept apart in another wave of jostling combat. A moment later, the colonel slipped and fell as a coal-black negro chopped at him with a broken cutlass. Jack Cockerell flew at him, and they wrestled until Hiplock threw the negro to the deck, where the colonel made him one pirate less. Formidable as these outlaws were, they lacked the stern cohesion which had been drilled into the sailors of the Royal Navy and likewise learned in the hard school of the merchant service. Very slowly, the odds were shifting against Blackbeard's crew. It was unmistakable when Lieutenant Maynard cut his way through to join Colonel Stewart, while the third group of boarders was advancing little by little from the after quarter. This meant that the force was gradually uniting in spite of the furious efforts to scatter it. And now there came an episode which lives in history two centuries after that scene of carnage on the decks of the stranded brig. It has preserved the name of a humble lieutenant of the Royal Navy and saved it from the oblivion which is the common lot of most brave men who do and dare when duty beckons. Blackbeard was bleeding from a dozen wounds and yet his activity was unabated. He was like a grizzly bear at bay. His men began to believe that his league with Satan, of which he obscenely boasted, had made him invulnerable. He was all that he had proclaimed himself to be, the wickedest and most fearsome pirate of the western ocean. And all the while, the slender, boyish Lieutenant Maynard, sailor and gentleman, had one aim in mind, and that was to slay Captain Edward Teach with his own hand. Nor was he at all content until he had cleared a path to where the hairy pirate was playing havoc with his broadsword. With a loud laugh and mockery, Blackbeard snatched a loaded pistol from one of his men and fired at this foppish young officer who presumed to single him out. The ball chipped Maynard's ear and he dodged the pistol which was hurled at his head. It was curious to note a lull in the general engagement. A little interval of suspense while men regained their breath or tried to staunch their wounds. They were unconsciously awaiting the verdict of this duel between their leaders. Jack Cockerell, for instance, finding himself alone by some chance, leaned against a stanchion and heard his own blood drip, drip on the deck. It was a fleeting respite. Blackbeard swung his sword with the might of those wide shoulders behind it. The lieutenant stepped aside like lightning, and the bright weapon whistled past his arm. Then they went at each other like blacksmiths, sparks flying as steel bit steel. Dexterity and a cool wit were a match for the pirate's untamable strength. Gory, snarling Blackbeard shortened his stroke to use the point. The lieutenant dropped to one knee, thrust upward, and found a vital spot. Blackbeard stood staring at him with wonder in his eyes. Then those thick, bowed legs gave way and he toppled like a tree uprooted. He passed out quietly enough with no more cursing, and in his last moment of sensibility, his thoughts appeared to wander far to his youth as a brisk merchant seaman out of Bristol Port, for he was heard to mutter with a long sigh, A pretty babe as ever was, Molly, and the mortal image of its mother. To his waist, the sable beard covered him like a pall, and one corded arm was flung across his breast, and it showed the design of the skull and crossbones pricked in India ink. Then, as if the dead leader had issued the command, the surviving pirates began to fling down their weapons and loudly cry for quarter. They need not have felt ashamed of the resistance they had made up to this time, but now the delirium of combat had slackened and Blackbeard was no more. One or two of his officers were alive, and they knew that the game was lost. Reinforcements could be sent from the sloops and the brigantine as soon as they were signaled for, and there was no flight from a stranded ship. Blackbeard had been able to infuse them with his own madness. Better chance the gallows than no quarter. 
Here and there, a few of the most desperate dogs of the Spanish main, who had followed Blackbeard's fortunes a long time, refused to surrender, but they were either shot down or overpowered. Captain Wellesby was sending off two boats from the King George with his surgeon, and the sloops were kedging in closer to the quay with a rising tide. Half the seamen were beyond aid, and of the pirates no more than twenty were alive. Jack Cockrell was thankful to have come off so lightly, and he consoled himself with the notion that a scar across his cheek would be a manly memento. Colonel Stewart had been several times wounded, but tis hard killing a Highlander. It was Lieutenant Maynard's duty to offer public proof that he had slain none other than the infamous Blackbeard, wherefore he made no protest when his armorer hacked off the head of the dead pirate. There was no feeling of chivalry due to a fallen foe, valiant though his end had been. This horrid trophy was tied at the end of a sloop's bowsprit to be displayed for the gratification of all honest sailormen who might behold it in port. It was not a gentle age on blue water, and Captain Edward Teach had been the death of many helpless people during his wicked career. Lieutenant Maynard announced that he would take the two sloops into Bath Town before proceeding to Virginia. As they were overcrowded vessels, and the survivors of the boarding party needed proper care ashore, it would also afford the unscrupulous Governor Eden of North Carolina an opportunity to see his friend, Captain Teach, as a pirate who would divide no more plundered merchandise with him. The brigantine King George was ready to escort them into Pamlico Sound, after which she would sail for Charlestown. Before the departure from the entrance of Cherokee Inlet, the stranded vessel was set afire and blazed grandly as the funeral pyre of Blackbeard's stout lads who would go no more a-roving. Never was a nurse more devoted than Joe Hawkridge when his comrade was mercifully restored to him. Jack was woefully pale and weak but in blithe spirits and thankful to have seen the last of Blackbeard. Hold in the leg and a damaged figurehead, said Joe as he sat on the edge of the hero's bunk. Trifling, I call it, when I expected to see you come aboard feet first wrapped in a bit of canvas. I don't want to talk about it, Joe. Let's find something pleasant. Ho for Charlestown, and the green trees and a bench in the shade, and a tidy little vessel after a while, you and me and the counselor are pleasuring up the coast with men in gear to fish up the treasure chest. And you believe that Blackbeard never got back to the inlet to save the treasure for himself? asked Jack. Not the way his ship was headed when she struck the shoal. The brigantine was well on her way to Charlestown when Captain Wellesby found that Master Cockerel could be carried into the comfortable main cabin to rest on a cushioned settle for an hour or two at a time. It was during one of these visits, when Joe Hawkridge was present, that the skipper remembered to say, Here is a bit of memorandum which may entertain you lads. Lieutenant Maynard had Blackbeard's quarters searched before the brig was burned. Some valuable stuff was found, but nothing what you call a pirate's treasure. The lads looked at each other, but kept their own counsel, and Captain Wellesby went on to explain. There was a private log, Blackbeard's own journal, with a few entries in it, and most of the leaves torn out. I made a copy of what could be read, for the late Captain Cheech was a better pirate than Scrivener. Here, Jack, you are the scholar. Jack read aloud this extract, which was about what might have been expected. Such a day, rum all out. Our company is somewhat sober, a confusion amongst us, rogues a-plottin', great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize, took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the company hot, very hot, then all things went well again. That sounds familiar enough to me, was Joe Hockridge's comment, and the rest of his writing will be much like it. Not so fast, exclaimed Captain Wellesby. Scan the next page, Jack. "'Twill fetch you up all standing. "'Not that it puts gold in our pockets, "'for we know not where to search, "'but I swear it will make your eyes sparkle "'and your mouth water.' "'Trying to hide his excitement, "'Jack saw a kind of rough inventory, "'and it ran like this. "'Where I hid it this cruise. "'One bag, 54 silver bars. "'One bag, 79 bars and pieces of silver. "'One bag, coined gold.' One bag, dust gold. Two bags, gold bars. 
One bag, silver rings and sundry precious stones. Three bags, unpolished stones. One silver box set with diamonds. Four golden lockets. Also, one silver porringer. Two gold boxins. Seven green stones. Rubies great and small. Sixty-seven pieces of eight and dollars. Also, one bag, lump silver. A small chain. A coral necklace. One bag, English crowns. Captain Jonathan Wellsby listened to this luscious recital with an air of mild amusement. He was of a temper too stolid and sensible to waste his time on random treasure hunting. Blackbeard might have chosen his hiding place anywhere along hundreds of leagues of coast. He could understand the agitation of those two adventurous lads to whom this memorandum was like a magic spell. Of such was the spirit of youth. Any more of it? demanded Joe Hawkridge. The next page was ripped out of the journal, answered the skipper. What cruise did he mean? If it was his last one, he may have hit it on the Virginia or Carolina coast. Master Cockerell gave it as an excuse that he had sat up long enough and would return to his bunk. He was fairly bursting for a conference with Joe, and as soon as they were alone, he exclaimed, It may be the sea chest. What do you think? A handsome clue, I call it. Something to warm the cockles of your heart, grinned the sea urchin. Aye, Jack, I should wager he wrote that down whilst he lay at anchor in Cherokee Inlet. It seems shabby of us to keep the secret from Captain Wellsby, but there is an obligation on us. To Bill Saxby and the old sea wolf, said Joe, we'll not forget this trump of a skipper when it comes to splitting up the treasure. I am anxious for Captain Bonnet and his crew remarked Jack. With this crusade against pirates afoot, our friends may be hanged before we see them again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read a story about May Day from the book Holidays and Happy Days, written by Hamish Hendry. Today's music was provided by the artist Drake Stafford. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. And as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Whoop, shark attack, nom 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 nom, huh? jellyfish, pan sandwich, turkey, snowman, dolphin, helicopter, last supper, monkey in the zoo. What? Gear shift. <laughs> 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 <laughs>